Today's second Bible reading comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, then continues with verses 8 to 16. In these verses and those surrounding, the author of this letter to the Hebrew Christians references many names of people who heard the promise of a kingdom to come, but did not live to see it. The focus of these verses is on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Sarah, who lived in a foreign land in tents, but had faith to look forward to a kingdom yet to come that was not built by human hands. We often struggle to be satisfied with what we have. Sometimes we wonder if we will have enough to get by. No matter what our worries may be, we can always be assured in the faith that this same kingdom that was promised to those before us is what we have to look forward to. We hear. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that, was, so that what is seen was not made out of what it was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of him of the same with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was, in was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so, from this one man, one man, as he and as he and he as good as dead came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. In the name of the Father who created us, and of the Son who redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. Amen. The portion of God's word that we're going to focus on this morning was the second Bible reading from Hebrews chapter 11. May I ask you a meditation on that word? Let's pray. Lord, when we consider what we believe, when we consider our faith, may we have the utmost confidence in what you tell us, because you don't lie, and you're always true, and you're always faithful. So may we trust you, no matter what we see. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, have you ever met a pastafarian? Okay, some of you got it. So this comes out of a person's letter to the Kansas Board of Education in 2005, where a man named Bobby Henderson wrote to them because at that time, the Board of Education of Kansas was considering adding along intelligent design to be taught alongside evolution. So Mr. Henderson said, well, if you're going to teach this theory of intelligent, of intelligent designer, it's just as valid as my belief that the world was created by a giant flying spaghetti monster. And we call ourselves Pastafarians. And we are numerous, and there are many of us, and if you're going to teach an intelligent designer, you need to also teach the giant flying spaghetti monster at the same time. So we don't really need to ask Mr. Henderson what he thinks when he maybe hears a verse like we heard today, especially verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Because yes, it's a very thin parody of Christianity. So what do you do with somebody who calls themselves a pastafarian? Do you just dismiss them? Like, okay, you just want to make fun of my faith, so you know what? I'm just not going to talk to you. I'm not going to deal with you because you obviously have no value in what I say. Or do you engage? Try to understand where are you coming from? Why? What brought you to this faith outlook and this faith statement? Or if we find
find ourselves kind of challenged of my God is no different than a flying giant spaghetti monster, that maybe I just need to hit that faith button and say, you know what, I don't care, I just have to believe. You know what, Mr. Henderson, you just have to believe that there's a God. We take it by faith. And wouldn't Mr. Henderson say right back, well, why don't you just take it by faith that there's a giant flying spaghetti monster who made the world? The point of the letter is to say that science and faith are different. And that's true. That's very true. Science and faith are not the same. Science is entirely based on observation. That's the scientific method. It basically observes the world and then creates hypotheses based on those observations, then runs concluding experiments to test those observations to find out whether or not that there are general truths. So at the end of the day, science is the best guess based on repeated observation. That's science. So what do you observe when you look at some of these patriarchs of the faith? What do you observe when you look at the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God had promised to Abraham when he left that country that you will own this foreign land. And yet, by the time he died, by the time Isaac died, by the time Jacob died, they all just lived in tents, not owning the land that they were living on. I guess the observation is God didn't keep his promise. Or... God's promise to Abraham, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands of the seashore. And by the time Abraham died, he had a total of eight kids. And that's a sizable number. He had one by Sarah, one by Hagar, six by Keturah. But ultimately, that's very short of the number of stars in the sky and exceedingly less than the sands of the seashore. So I guess if we're observing his life, God didn't make good. Or Sarah. That for year after year she was promised that she would have a son and yet still she couldn't conceive all the way up until she was 89 and at that point her body was beyond her childbearing years. Her husband was beyond childbearing years. Neither one of them biologically, naturally could have children. So what can we conclude by observing this? God doesn't keep his promises. And anyone who believes in God, if you look at these examples, you're going to be a failure if you live by faith. Do you sometimes observe the same in your own life? That there are promises that God makes and you're looking for them, and it's just not happening. That God says, hey, the righteous will live, the wicked will perish, and yet you observe the exact opposite, the wicked live and the righteous perish? That God promises to take care of me, to get me through everything, but yet my life just kind of seems to continually crumble and fall apart, and I'm kicked when I'm down, and I'm in this, this, this muck of, of depression and anxiety and worry, and I can't get out of it. Nothing's getting any better. I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Am I a failure to live by this faith? Or, just like we talked about here just a couple weeks ago, I pray to God, God, hey, take away the sickness, bring healing to my body, and then he doesn't. Faith failure. Or God said, I'll give you the words that you need to speak whenever you proclaim my word. The Holy Spirit will come to you. And yet, the time came and went, I remained silent. Faith failure. <laughs> we observe these things. And it causes us to wrestle, and, and what, do we, what conclusions can we come to when we observe and we're trusting in these promises, and yet they just don't seem to come to fruition? Is our faith just a failure? Is our God no God at all? Is our God no better than Mr. Henderson's flying spaghetti monster? That honestly, he's just a joke. Why bother? 
Well, maybe we need to understand what faith is, and not just what science is. Science is observation. If we're looking at faith as this magical potion, this cure-all, if I just have faith, everything will be better, everything will be grand, everything will be majestic and glorious, we will find ourselves as faith failures. Because that's not what faith is. Faith is, as the author to these Hebrew Christians says here in the verse, first verse of chapter 11, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is not observation. So faith is not science. It's not meant to be. No, in fact, you actually need faith in order to have science because even though you observe things with science, how do you know it's true? Ultimately, you have to put your faith in it and say that I trust the facts to be facts. Two plus two does actually equal four. Blue is actually the color blue because I can't prove it. And so I have to just accept this is what it is or it isn't. That's faith. But faith is not mindless. And faith is not this thing that says, oh, I've been challenged. Well, I just don't want to deal with it. I don't want to wrestle with those observations. So I'm just going to put this up on the shelf and try not to think about it. That's not faith either. No, faith actually is informed by our observations. Because go through those people again. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah. Not in their lifetime did they see the promises, but yet what exactly happened? We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob living in tents until the day they died, but we know, even to this day, their descendants own that land in Israel. I guess God came through. Abraham only had eight kids by the time he died, but yet there are lists and lists of name recorded in the Bible, those very sections that your eyes kind of glaze over at, and you're wondering, why on earth did God include this? You know what he did? It's empirical evidence that he actually kept his promise. It's an observation to say, you know what? There are too many names to count, and there are so many more. They're just numbers and millions and millions of people that came from this one man. And that's what leads this writer to record for us and so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And then Sarah, up to 89 years old, and she couldn't have kids biologically, naturally, physically. There's no way this could happen, but a year later, she's pregnant. She gives birth to Isaac. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. So we have to observe the whole thing, not just parts, not just pieces. Because at the end of this, when you look at the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, what's your conclusion? All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. The world would count them as faith failures. That they believed and it didn't happen in their lifetime. Yet the one who promised was faithful. And even though they didn't receive it in their lifetime, they looked forward to what was ahead. That's what faith does. Faith doesn't say, oh, I see it in front of me, now I believe it. Faith says, I don't see it, but I'm going to consider the source. I'm going to consider the one who's going to tell me about the future, who's going to tell me about the things I can't see. I'm going to choose to believe. Because we are putting our faith into something. The question is what? If I put my faith in observations, have I ever recalled something wrong? Have I ever thought I've seen something and it wasn't actually what I saw? Maybe that isn't what I should put my faith in. 
Should I put my faith in feelings? How it makes me feel. Have my feelings ever changed? Have my feelings ever got me to feel one way, and then I found out later that was that was wrong, that was bad. Maybe I should put my faith in somebody else. But then I have to ask, have they ever been wrong? Even just one time. Because if they're wrong even once, I know it's a flawed faith. That it won't actually come through. There is always a chance that they could be wrong. But then we observe God. And you get to look at promise after promise after promise. And every single one kept to the minutest detail, ones that maybe we could shrug off and say that's just a variation. It doesn't really matter if that wasn't completed. Yet God made a point of keeping every single one of them down to the T. He is trustworthy because he is faithful. He does not lie. He does not just change his mind. He doesn't fail to come through, but every single time he has. You know, we don't always trust him. That even though he's never let us down, we have a hard time saying, what you say is true, God, and I'm going to trust you even though I can't see it. Instead, we're consumed by the things right in front of our eyes, and we say, because of what I see right now, this can't be true. But that doesn't change God's faithfulness. It doesn't change the fact that he actually does follow through on every single one of his promises. You know, if anything, God should call us faith failures. Because he's given us no reason to doubt him. No reason to question him. And yet we do. God should be ashamed of us. But he's not. Because he also did an incredible thing. Something he had promised long ago, something that he had promised to Abraham himself. That all nations would be blessed through you, so as through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, all the way through to David, and through Mary. Then God came. He didn't just turn his back on us, not look at us because he was so ashamed, but instead he came down from heaven, took on our flesh, specifically to carry our shame, our shameful mistrust on his shoulders. That every time we ever doubted God, every time that we questioned whether or not he was going to follow through, he took that to the cross. And he paid for it. Paid for it with his blood. Paid for it with his life. That never once did he doubt God's will and God's word, but trusted on it, lived on it, knew that man did not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so with his payment... Our sins were taken away. And still, even in death, after God had forsaken him, after God had turned his back on himself, on Jesus, Jesus trusted what he could not see, that three days later he would raise him from the dead and so would validate everything that he had done, that his life given for the sins of the world, for the shame, that we have incurred because we doubt that that would be gone, and that's exactly what happened. It was observed, and people told us, and they wrote it, and they recorded it, and it's been preserved, and we now have seen it. So faith doesn't just say, well, I'm not going to think about this. I'm just going to throw it to the side. No, faith does, let's take this down, let's look at it. Let's see what it is. Let's see if the words that were spoken have held true. Let's see if he has actually come through on his promises. And that's what we find. A God who has been faithful to us, a God who has been faithful to his promises, and by doing so, he has taken away our shame. So God is not ashamed to call us his family. Not out of obligation, not like... Oh, well, I have to. I'm related to them. No, it's not because he's related to us. No, it's because he brought us into his family. It's because Jesus himself paid for our sins, and so he is not ashamed to call us brothers. And we live by this faith, believing in the things that we have not personally observed, but we know the one who has told us, and that one is faithful. 
And that's why God says of us just what he said of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Sarah. God is not ashamed to call, to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So there's even more yet that we haven't seen, and yet God promises. And because God has always come through with his promises, we're going to say right now, too, it's not about what I observe. It's not about science. It's about what he said. Faith and science, they are good things. They're both gifts from God. And with science, we can observe God keeps his promises. God does what he says he's going to do. And so now when he asks me, trust the next thing, trust the thing you don't see, that's when we live by faith. And God promises you will never be a failure when you live by faith in me. Instead, I'm not ashamed of you. I call you my God. You belong to me. You are my people because you live by faith. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.